probably the most surreal thing that's ever happened to me was um, I was on Capitol Hill visiting the Capitol um, a few months ago when they evacuated because they thought there was an enemy plane in the vicinity. In the vicinity. Um, and so we had just gotten out of the building and they were yelling at everyone, everyone around the building to evacuate. And it was surreal because behind us were probably something like a million people all dressed up in business suits, heels, just bolting down the sidewalk. It was a mass of people. And for all we knew, we could be bombed in a moment. We didn't know what was happening. But just seeing all those people in such a rush and such a such haste to get out, like to save their lives, was really surreal. Um, probably my most rewarding experience was teaching English in Tibet this summer. I just got back on Wednesday morning and I was there for a month. Um, the kids we taught were all older than me, which was not at all what I was expecting. But when they finally opened up, I felt really good about what I was doing and it was, it was a really rewarding experience. And I would really like to go back there sometime and help them some more. So my most ex ex um, memorable experience of recent history that I remember was hanging around at DM Lowe's down in Worcester before the show, a Bob Weir rat dog show. And uh, we're listening to Bob Weir warm up with his band. And uh, Bob came out, we met him, we got our picture taken with him. He did a warm up set. It sounded really great. And then uh, that night, the first being open and open and act opens up, then the place fills up with smoke, and then the, the show got canceled, so we were the only ones that saw Bob Weir that day. Check. Oh, well, yeah, we got a picture taken with him too, but I wish I had, I'd show you today. Thank you. Uh, I think for me, I have uh, an experience that was pretty crazy and scary and, and really stupid um, for me was to uh, be up in Lake George area down the Shroon River in New York, up in the Adirondacks, and uh, we were up there in May, and um, we were taking the canoe down the Shroon River, and we decided to go up a little higher in the canoe, and uh, I was with my sister-in-law. And, of course, she had a life jacket on, but I'm just too crazy, ignorant, stupid. <laughs> and uh, the, the, the uh, canoe just ended up filling with water within the first minute of being in there. And uh, I somehow ended up grabbing onto the oar, which wrapped around the rope and being dragged down the river. And uh, for the first time, actually went from thinking I was going to die to knowing I was going to die um, hitting the rocks. It was just a crazy, horrendous experience. And I think I got down the river about a mile and a half and someone was able to pull me out. And uh, I'll tell you, that was pretty stupid and scary. And I don't know, that's about it. The most stupidest thing I did was I was at Six Flags and I pulled Porky Pig's tail and I made him fall. It was funny. It was funny though because like I pulled his tail and then I'm like he fell. It was so funny. He fell on his butt. He, and then Tweety Bird started crying. And then I told Tw then Tweety Bird like started crying because I told my Tweety Bird that I have a, I have a bird named Stupid because my mom stepped on him. And then I told Sylvester he can eat him. It was funny. Well, just by chance, you may have come upon the tiniest, the youngest and the most adorable psychotherapist in Western Massachusetts. This is Yum Yum, and he's seven weeks and three days old. He was donated to the Youth Music Ministry, hence his name, Yum Yum, Y-M-M, Y-M-M, -M, by a young lady who has been working with Ecuadorians, and I have just gone to Ecuador and come back. And so he was donated so that the kids in Springfield could have a pet. 
Now, the unexpected result is that Yum Yum has been helping these kids in, in uh, Springfield and South Hadley open up. They hold him and he emits some kind of magical power in which he starts helping them to tell their life stories. And they start telling him all of their problems. They tell him their joys. They tell him their secrets. And then they are also engaged in training him. Um, he's just had his first bath on Friday. He went to his first vet's uh, visit on Tuesday. And the kids spent two hours with the vet learning how to take his temperature, how to feed him, how to give him medication, how to weigh him, um, what his growth and development were going to be. But the unexpected result is that he not only works with kids, but he also works with adults. So everywhere he goes, the, quote, <clears throat> older people come up to Yum Yum and they start talking to him. And they start asking him, who is he? Can they hold him? And then the little old ladies, they say, oh, he is so cute. And some of them who've been depressed for months or years, they just start opening up. So he's gone into hospitals in his short two weeks that we've had with us, uh, had him with us. He's gone into hospitals, restaurants, churches, parks, um, stores. And we stopped at a, at a um, red light and the policeman directing traffic actually stopped directing traffic, came over to the car and asked if he could hold him. So when Yum Yum is held like this, this is where he likes to be, close to people's pulse and neck, and um, he just brings out the best in everybody. Everybody he meets. Seven weeks and three days old. So he has about, we think, 15 years of life. His pedigree is a Heinz 59, maybe Heinz 60. We're not sure. Um, as you can see by his tiny little paws, he's never going to be a big mite, but he might be the little engine that could. Um, and his father seems to be curly, black-haired poodle, and the mother seems to be a white, straight-haired something terrier. Um, and I'm the director of the Youth Music Ministry, and this was the perfect touch that the kids needed for the summer. Someone to love. My most amazing experience was adopting my daughter Lola from Ethiopia. Um, I decided that I wanted to adopt a child. I'm a single woman. I decided I wanted to adopt a child about two years ago. So I started the process last year in January. And in November of last year, I went to Ethiopia with my sister and I brought home my daughter Lola. Um, I would say that it was one of the most amazing experiences that I've ever had because I got a chance to see the environment that she came from and I also got a chance to actually see with my own eyes um, the type of life that she would have led if she had not been adopted. Um, I think that I can give her a better life here in America but also I do feel that it's important for her to know where she came from in Ethiopia. Um, that's about it. <laughs> My daughter has an amazing trick. She's my personal squeeze toy. Watch this. <laughs> She's very outgoing and she loves people. So she fits in very well with my life. <laughs> That's it. The most ludicrous thing that ever happened to me was I was arrested uh, in Dunn, North Carolina in 1970, I believe it was 1974. I was a hair, part-time hairdresser and college student at the time. I was working in a small salon and uh, I'd come in from my uh, school and I receptionist said, Lou, you've got a, uh, a haircut. This gentleman over here wants a haircut. So I took him to the station and I touched his hair with a set of scissors and he called the police and I was arrested. The case was it was illegal for a man to have his hair cut by a cosmetologist. We had a, a, a full, uh, we had a peer in court uh, and as a period it was an antiquated law they called it the uh, sexuality of the hair and uh, case was dismissed and the law was changed however I did have to uh, 
go down to the police station in back of the police car and uh, it turned out to be uh, someone had to do the job. The most embarrassing experience I ever had was when my grandpa, um, well, he was in our backyard and he smokes and um, he flicked a cigarette butt out into the grass and I was inside and I yelled out the window, pick it up to him. That was it? <laughs> the most wet birthday I ever had was two years ago when my mom bought these candles, they were really tall and um, they were trick candles, so they, um, they um, when you blew them out, they flecked back on, so put them on the cake, and I blew out the candles. I didn't know they were trick candles, and then they lit back up again, and then my friend, he was afraid because he thought that the pie might catch on fire, so he threw his water on it, and half of the pie, and I got all wet. Mama! Nay, nay. Two, three. Oh. I'm going to share with you my most blissful moment when my son was born and I can speak for both my husband and myself when I, I say it was both of our most blissful moments and um, I just remember strongly the, the air in the room when he came, just the, the purest um, atmosphere in, in that room, the moment that he came and how um, it's just a moment that we won't forget. His, his first breath of air when he changed from purple to our, our skin color and um, it was just how beautiful that was. This was the most unusual happening in my life. Once when I was fishing a big bass just came right out from under the dock. I, I, I got the bait right in his face. He looked at it he swam around it and just swam right away. And this was the most unforgettable happening in my life when I was climbing up a mountain and when I went to try and move over a little bit, I ended up going on my side and rolling down. Luckily, I hit a tree with my back, so I, end, so I ended up going back down to the house that I was staying at for that time, and that was about the end. And this was the most um, weird thing ever. We saw this fish that we did not know what it was. Just kind of big with white spots on the silver line across it. And it would bite the bait but we couldn't hook through. The hook was too small so it couldn't puncture its skin. And every time we would jerk the pole, it would, it would feel the tug and it would spit it back out. But it would keep going at it until, one, until a pumpkin seed got the bait and we ended up pulling him out because there was no way to unhook him until we got him out. So we kept on trying and trying and trying, but we never could and he just kind of swam off. This is my most paranormal experience in life. I was in bed getting ready to sleep. My cat was on the pillow behind me and paper crumpled all the way across the room. Sophie sat up and started walking over curiously. The next morning we saw a folded up piece of paper when we went to go see. And this would be 
Wer mischt? Ähm. Unusual thing in life. Sophie, my cat. I can go down, play around with her, but when she gets mad, she jumps over me. No matter how far away she is from my forehead, though, I still feel the pain of a bite. Even if she's in my hand three feet away all the time that she is in the air. That I do not understand. You can't fly. They just don't okay, want I believe the most amazing thing in the last few, few years is the presidency and once again getting us into a war, the same as the Vietnam War, and the people of this nation bought the story that is killing people today and tomorrow and for God knows how long. It's amazing that they got that lie across to the public and put us in another war. That's the most amazing thing I've seen in the last decade. The luckiest thing that happened to me was when I was um, in Germany and there was like a man and he did a dog show and I need, um, and he asked if somebody wanted to play a dog and um, he picked me out and then I played the dog and then I got 40 euros from him. Okay, this is a story that goes way back when uh, I was in college at Penn State. Uh, basically, uh, it was a custom back then to, for everybody to go to Florida for a spring break. Well, w myself and several other fellows, we didn't really plan that. We were just sitting around the kitchen and saying, well, you know, here we are all alone. Everybody went home. Let's do something. So we decided we were going to uh, drive to Fort Lauderdale from Penn State. One fellow had a car, uh, an old convertible, and... Uh, <laughs> and... And... So, so we, we, we discussed it and we, we anticipated that it, it was going, I figured it out that how much money do we have? And we said, well, we have about $20 a piece is all we could, have, we could do to go to Florida and back in this car. Of course, this was in 1959. So uh, I said, well, it, the way I figured it's going to be $13 each for gasoline to get there. So uh, we, uh, I said, I'm not going to go unless you guys give me the 13 bucks now so we'll, I'll be sure of getting down there and back which they agreed to which left us seven dollars a piece for to spend on this entire vacation so we we raided the kitchen a big bag of a big uh, jar of beans and whatever we could scrounge for food on the way down and we jumped in the car with our uh, our, our money a total of eighty dollars four of us so when we got when we got there uh, we, we motored all the way down and it was it was a long deep drive you know 20 some hours we got there each of us had a goal one fellow was gonna was going to uh, go to a racetrack and place a two dollar bet uh, another guy was going to um, buy a case of beer and another was going to uh, I forget what it was exactly but and I was just going to survive and have enough to eat so we did all this and we were only there one day and we started on our way back uh, and on our way back, the tires of the car started to fail and uh, blow out uh, or, or a flat. I was repairing, I was the auto man, so I was repairing these flats all the time. And in fact, it got so bad, it got so bad that we were down to a casing. I was trying to buy a casing for $2 so that I could repair it and, and make it the rest of the way. So about 2 a.m. one morning on this four lane highway, the last tire that I had patched with cardboard and everything gave out and there we were pretty much without money in the center of this highway. So two of us got out and we rolled this tire just down the highway. We didn't know what was ahead or how far we'd have to go but it turned out we were lucky. It was like a mile or maybe three quarters of a mile till we got to a gas station. So I asked the guy, well, uh, would you, uh, would you uh, help us out here. I said, could I buy a casing from you for two dollars? Well, he just didn't want to give us the time of day. This was, I think, in Fredericksburg, Virginia. And he just really wasn't too interested. But there was this fellow standing there. Now, this is two o'clock in the morning. 
This guy's standing in a suit, which seems strange. He's just standing there and observing this whole thing. And finally he said, look, why don't you give the guys a hand? You, I'll take care of this. You get him a tire, fix this tire. So we fixed the tire. We got in his car. He said, come with me. And we, we, we got in his car and um, we, we had a few anxious moments there. We were wondering what this guy's motives were as he was driving us away in this new car, where it's just two, the two of us. And then he, he drove up to his house and uh, exchanged his car and then had a wagon with all flags and everything. And he took us to a dealership and he said, there was a mound of tires there, just a mound of tires or defects, or but they were really good tires. So we searched through them, we got four good tires, threw them back in, went back to the highway, jacked, uh, we had to repair it, jacked the car up, all the police were there, they, all these policemen knew this guy very well, they knew just who he was, and, and uh, so uh, we, we went back to the gas station and the guy that wouldn't help us out originally put all these new tires on us. And of course, I said to the fellow at the end, I said, you know, we don't have any money. We really can't do anything for you now. He says, look, all I want from you is that you, you remember this and, and you do this for someone else. And that's all, that's all the pay I expect. So, and, and as we were ready to pull out, the gas station attendant said, you guys should be thankful that you ran into Tommy Granville. I think that was his name. And uh, the, uh, it was like a lone ranger, you know, who was that masked man kind of thing. As we drove off, we, you know, we laughed about it. We, we made it home with about two bucks left and, uh, that, that night, and we sat around and we vowed. Nice meeting, Lars, nice meeting you, Lars. We, 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 sat, we sat around and, uh, and uh, vowed that we were going to do something for this guy. But you know how young guys are, all the good intentions in the world. Uh, we didn't do anything. We sat, we talked about it, and we, we let it go. And, uh, but I had his address, and I kept his address. And then about... A year later, a year later, we're sitting in the same time of the year, uh, remembering this trip that we took and remembering how this guy helped us out. And and at that time, I said, you know, we got to do something for this. I'm going to do something for this guy. So I, I found his address and I wrote him this letter, you know, saying something along the lines of, um, well, you know, we. I just want you to know that we're still remembering what a great thing you did for us, even though it's a year later, and blah, blah, blah. We just we said all that, and I thought that would be just something that would be more meaningful than if we just said thank you a week later. So about a week, about a week later, almost by return mail, I get this big, long, rambling letter from the guy. I guess he still lived there, and, and basically it said, he said, you cannot imagine what this letter meant to me. He said he was he was losing his business. He was he was uh, his wife was divorcing him. He was contemplating suicide, and uh, he he got this letter, and it just turned him around and it restored his faith in humankind, and that's pretty much it. So it was a deal where it, he was the beneficiary of his good deed, and I guess that's the end of that story. <laughs>